so we have this geographic advantage. We have the cultural advantage. We have developers that graduate from universities in the U.S. and Canada and come back here. So we have similar educational um, advantages. And um, I think that is where we need to look at as a, as a region. This week, I have Egbert von Frankenberg here. Hey. That's how you use that pronunciation? On That's you? right, yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. So you are the <clears throat> CEO of Nightfox App, App Design. Design. Yeah. Uh, what else can you tell me about yourself? Well, I came to Jamaica in 2006, um, originally from Berlin. Um, before I came here, though, I went to school in... Alaska, um, then Cambridge, London, and I lived in Tokyo for a year. Then I moved to the Middle East, and then I finally made it to Jamaica and never left. You came to Jamaica in 2006. Six, 2006. Mm. Oh, how old were you when you came? 26? I left Berlin when I was 17. So okay. Why do you leave Berlin? It's a good question. I left because I wanted to see what else is out there in the world. Maybe also what is important to know. I grew up in East Berlin. Okay. I was eight when the wall came down. Berlin was a crazy place in the 90s. Um, the culture scene was just exploding. I always wanted to see what else is out there. And for people who don't know, like East Berlin... It was the communist side of Germany. Okay, yes. okay. It's uh, almost like growing up in Cuba. When, that, when the wall came down, mm -hmm. what was the transition like? Things were very different. I mean... You, you had to learn things that you never saw before. I remember in the supermarket, they were, um, there was a big sign by the fruit stand mm -hmm. with pictures of fruits and what their names were because people never seen them before. And I, to this day, I prefer apple juice to orange juice because we never had orange juice. I grew up on apple juice. Mm -hmm. We only had oranges um, for Christmas time. And when you were lucky, you got some bananas in the summer. I'm used to growing up somewhere where you have to make do with what you have, right? right? And I think to this day that kind of helps when you're in Jamaica because you do have to find creative ways of making things work sometimes. Mm -hmm. So did like when it, when it comes to, I guess, kept catching up with the, the west side of Germany, mm -hmm. what, how much of that happened in those eight years? Well, you said you left at 17 Things were changing. You started to travel, travel around Europe. Um, I remember I was the first one in my family to get a West German passport when I was nine, mm -hmm. when I went to Sweden. Sweden was my first trip outside of Germany. Yeah. So it was interesting because even within Germany, because you were from the East, you were looked at differently by the West. So you, you kind of grew up knowing like, almost like how you are as a minority. And then if you think about it, everywhere else I traveled, being a German, I was always the minority. All the way even to Japan, you are always, I always grew up being in a minority. Right. So I kind of found my place within that. And I actually don't like going back to Germany. Mm. I'm, I'm very far removed now from it or from its culture because since I've traveled and got exposed so much, I found a lot of things that I don't like about the German culture. Um, but there's also a lot of things that I'm proud of as in, in the German culture right. that I kept because I, they made me who I am today. So I was able to pick and choose, which was very fortunate, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I definitely want to talk about what kind of similarities you found you know, with, with your travels and, and, and with Jamaica and also why after going through all your travels, you've kind of settled down with Jamaica. But let's jump into a bit about Night Fox mm -hmm. app design and where that got started. You came to Jamaica in 2006 mm -hmm. and you did a number of things. You were working with Sanders, you were working with other places. Yeah, I started at RATV. Right, RATV. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. At the time, Kimani, who was the owner, was doing the expansion and he needed someone to take care of um, developing the, broad, the brand overseas. So 
one of the f main things that we did at the time was sending the signal over a satellite so we can broadcast it outside of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And then I quickly started to, to take on the operations role and basically oversee the broadcast. At the time, we switched from a six-hour loop to a proper 24-hour playtime, a broadcasting server. So pretty much building up the entire operating system that was required for a 24-hour TV station. Right. When I was at RETV, I met, I hired my now business partner, Robert. And that's how we first met. At that time, he was in university and um, studying computer science. We just clicked, you know, it became this bond. We were like buddies hanging out. And it took a couple of years. I mean, you know, he was a freelancing. I was working at Sandals, but then in 2013, we said, let's start a business. Let's see where this can go. We started making our own applications. People started to approach us. Can you build this for us? Can you build that? And then it just evolved. It's no wholly a boutique um, yeah. company. At what point did the business become self-sustaining? Maybe after about a year and a half to two years. So there were some times where, you know, you had to manage your cash flow. Mm -hmm. Managing cash flow is as a startup. I always look at the cash flow more than balance sheet or profit and loss yeah. because the cash flow is what makes you to, you know, helps you to the next month or not. So you have to make some critical decisions sometimes in order to keep your cash flow alive. Robert and yourself, you were working full-time jobs all, all elsewhere or you were just like putting everything into? When things started to pick up, we worked on bigger projects. It was time for me to, to leave Sandals mm -hmm. and then focus fully on, on the job. And then it started to grow. So we then needed to hire a project manager, more developers, it's running simultaneous projects, and it just keeps evolving. And, and we're still in this phase where the biggest thing for us to learn is how do we scale the business? I think every startup has that, has that learning curve to find how do you scale your business. Right. Were you afraid when you got started considering that IT on, on a whole is a pretty new field, a pretty young young industry, and yeah. there's not, not a lot of confidence in it in Jamaica. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I have a family with two children to support, so yeah, it is it is a scary mm -hmm. scary situation to jump into. But um, we saw that there is an opportunity and there is a future for it in in the Caribbean, um, based on contacts that we have made outside of Jamaica and what the demand is for work from here and um, so we're confident and it, funny enough the more work we got from overseas the more local companies then trusted us with their projects right which is a bit of a I, I wouldn't say a shame but I wish there was more confidence in the industry but as you said it is an infancy uh, industry and um, it just it takes time for us to develop it and make it to the point where it is something that can be proud of. Almost all the businesses that we've interviewed, that we've done this podcast for, whether they um, are in IT or not in IT, mm -hmm. they've, they've had that similar experience where you know we, we had to kind of do work overseas first yeah. to get the recognition to, to then yeah. get some clients in Jamaica, yeah. which is really a shame, like you said. Yeah. And then, you know, you have to foster the talent as well. So um, there's, there are talented kids that can code, but then... Obviously, the first thing for them to do is to try and leave Jamaica and get jobs elsewhere, right. which is uh, puts us into this catch-22. We need the developers here mm -hmm. so we can get more jobs coming to Jamaica and more projects here. Um, otherwise, we won't get the projects and so forth. So it's, it is a bit of a struggle that we see within the industry. And David Bain and I have debated that several times and how to overcome this and what needs to happen. And I think within the industry, we starting to create some form of a cluster where we can all um, find a common ground and how we as an industry move forward. And I think that's very important. Um, I think the BPO industry has shown us what can be done. And right. there is the focus there right now from the government as well. And I see our industry as a subculture mm -hmm. of that BPO industry. Mm -hmm. It is important for us to be within that realm and, and make it known that there is a higher value um, 
blockchain opportunity within Jamaica already. And that there are companies here that can support. So I don't think we covered this. So tell everybody about what Nightfox App Design is and what is it you do. So Nightfox App Design is a boutique um, software development firm. Right. And um, we mainly focus on cloud applications and mobile phone applications, okay. um, really depending on what is required by the client. So it's a lot of um, client custom work. Some of our clients are companies like Digicel. Um, we just built um, uh, an online learning platform for them. So Robert and I are actually flying to Fiji in two weeks mm -hmm. to implement it on their systems in the Pacific. Um, so it's some interesting work that we do. Um, aside from that, we do have some white label products that are versatile and can be integrated into our clients' operations, like yeah. a coupon platform and loyalty platform. And they're white label because that way we just want to deal with the technology and implement it and make it something that is part of your operations. And um, so far, that strategy seems to be working for us. Okay, cool. Tell me about one of your first projects that you, that you did um, in the early days that like, gave you the confidence to say, all right, this is something that we should continue moving forward in. There comes a time in every business where you're wondering, am I seeing enough progress to keep business moving forward or should I go in a different direction? The first pivoting for us came when we built our first app called Emergency, which is an um, app where you can click either police, ambulance, or fire. Mm -hmm. And it found your location in Jamaica and which ones were the five closest to you. Okay. So you could call them directly or find them on the map to get there. Um, because you know how when you're when you're trying to call the police and you don't know where you are, which one is the closest police station to call or trying to, the 119 number might not work. Mm -hmm. So we saw a need for that. Um, and then that wasn't enough because we're like, okay, well, how do we support this now? <laughs> we need to try and make some money while we're focused, while we're working on these projects that are close to us, right? right? And then it just kept happening that we found work and we got excited by the work and we kept doing the work. The first two major projects that we did were um, the Sportsmax website and the Loop News product. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of learning curve on it, but I think it, it helped us to, to see what our capabilities are and where we can go. Um, it was a scary time because it was quite a demanding project. After that, we had other projects coming um, like Learning Hub, um, which is an online learning platform for schools. Mm -hmm. And and it just kept going and growing. Um, so yeah, we have we have projects that are versatile. And even our developers, they keep saying that um, they like that the work is so different and each client is challenging in a different way. And I think that is good because it shows that there is opportunity here in broadening your horizon as a developer because you get the the feel for these different types of projects, right. not just sticking within one where you maintain a code. And When it comes to broadening horizons and, and even uh, keeping up with technology right now, what are some of the projects that you're working on that is like pushing the boundaries of, of where technology is? Well, we are currently researching in two areas that I'm personally putting a lot of time in, and that is um, AI. Mm -hmm. So we're doing some tests for... Um, the call center industry right now on providing machine learning um, analytics okay. and call analytics using um, speech recognition and then analyzing that data um, and the sentiment and the comprehension of what is being said in the calls. Tell me more about it because, I mean, I used to be heavily involved in the BPO industry. Mm -hmm. Like I, I worked on the phones for a while. I mm -hmm. worked in, in quality assurance. And you're telling me that... That's exactly the area you're that we're targeting. Using... Right. So, AI. Okay, tell yeah. me more about So that. instead of doing the quality assurance by someone listening to a call and actually acting subjectively on an objective task of marking it, right. uh, also only being able to do a sample of all the core calls, what we are currently are in a testing mode is to um, take the recorded calls, get them transcribed into text, 
and then use um, an, a, a text recognition AI that is based on the same backend as Alexa mm -hmm. to then analyze the calls by the sentiment of if it's a positive call or a negative call um, so that then the operator or the, the BPO industry company can then look at this dashboard and get a faster understanding of what happens within the calls rather than relying on these samples. Mm -hmm. But I think it will be able to complement what is being done because you get this quicker overview. That is huge because, I mean, I can tell you from working inside um, the, the VBA industry being on the phones, you kind of hope and pray and cross your fingers that the bad call that you, mm -hmm. that you made, they don't catch that. Mm -hmm. And most of the times, they, they will sit through the cracks. Yeah. But if that happens and that becomes a pattern, you can have people who are on the phones just constantly pro providing bad customer service, mm -hmm. but you just never know. Mm -hmm. And overall, that will just reduce yeah. reduce the, the the call center's ability to 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 get yeah. to get get work. Yeah, and I think even also it can create an additional service to their clients mm -hmm. because um, maybe ma majority of the calls say that they like the the car that you rent, right? Or they like the specific service or a specific product that right. you offer that the company might not have caught on through their market um, research. True, yeah. So I think there is an added benefit on that side as well to give this direct feedback. Mm -hmm. It would have been an off comment on a call before, mm -hmm. but now you can, able to, you can capture that Correct. data for sure. And, yeah, and if that is, you know, if you hear that in several calls, mm -hmm. then, you know, you, you can flag it. Yeah. Now, I want to also talk about kind of what are the lessons that you learned in growing up in those times in East Germany, that that kind of made you who you are as an entrepreneur. Um, but I want to come back to something that we said we're going to talk about, which was why Jamaica. So you, you went to Alaska, we're in the Middle East. You traveled a lot of, all over the world, Japan. Why settle in Jamaica? What 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 about Jamaica was appealing to you? I would lie if I say it's not it has nothing to do with the weather. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's but it's more than that. It's the weather. It's the people is the culture. Um, I when I came, I met my now wife, and and so that was also one of the main reasons right. why I stayed. Yeah. Um, and I saw it as a as a place of opportunity. In a very beautiful part of the world, how do you see it as an opportunity when so many others are seeing it as a place to to leave and find opportunities elsewhere? That's a good question. I think the reason might be that everyone that has the drive to leave is not exposed to the opportunities that exist here. Um, yesterday, I gave a guest lecture at the Portmore Community College, right. and there are um, developers, quite talented young young minds, right? Yeah. And um, I asked them, so when you're done here, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to leave because we don't see any um, opportunities here. And only when I started to then say, well, did you know that this is happening here or that is happening here or that you can do X, Y, and Z from Jamaica, They're, they started to rethink and be like, oh, that is possible out here and I can do this and I can get this done out here. And and so I think, I think the government is doing a good job at this point where there you can see that the economy is turning around. Right. So I think more and more opportunities will present themselves and hopefully grab uh, the human capital that we have here to stay. Um, that's, that's what I'm hoping. But yeah, I saw it as a place of opportunity and excitement. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't as saturated and, and complete as other parts of the world. So there was still a lot of work to do, to be done. Mm -hmm. I looked at it as a challenging of work that needs to be done. Whereas if you go to the America or Japan, things like that are already done, you know? Yeah. So I think I wanted to contribute somewhere where I can help get there. I think that's, the, that's, that's one of the defining differences between entrepreneurs and probably everybody else, which is the idea of when, when they look at Jamaica, 
they see both pe- both people on either side look at Jamaica, they see problems. Mm-hmm. But entrepreneurs look at it and say, these are opportunities. Mm-hmm. While everybody else is like, I should just leave because there's so much there's so many problems here to deal yeah. with. So like what were some of the things you're telling the students at, at BCC? Well, the topic was mainly around cloud computing. Mm-hmm. You can access the cloud computing from here, so you do not need to go anywhere to serve projects or work on work with clients or even if you have your own application that you're trying to build right you can do that from here and you can find problems that you want to solve through tech in jamaica because you have access to the cloud you know and and a lot of the kids were were amazed because they were still looking at like yeah you have to buy a server you have to put a server somewhere like no that's all past you don't do that anymore but even if you look at companies um I was at an Amazon conference a couple of weeks ago, and it is said that was in within Caribbean and Brazil um, and Latin America, only about ten percent of companies have switched or migrated from their traditional infrastructure to cloud infrastructure, which is which means there's still a lot of opportunity out there to help and facilitate that migration. Right. Um, so yeah, and and what a lot of people also don't know is that you can take your Amazon cloud certifications at the International Examination Board, yeah, Overseas Examination Board here in Kingston. So you do not, you can do a lot of things from from here. I think there is an entrepreneurial spirit here, and Jamaica as a whole. I think it's part of the culture of getting ahead and finding ways to get ahead. Probably some of the most struggle were in the early days where um, managing staff. Okay. Um, because I was not from the culture, mm-hmm. but I was able to prove myself based on my merits in a way, on what I was capable of, that I wasn't just put in that position to tell people to because I actually knew what was required for right. the job. So where did this come from? So yeah, we're going to take it all the way back to East Germany. Um, where do you think, or do you, can you track back your entrepreneurial spirit to that, to those experiences? Because you, you said that you mentioned, you mentioned that growing up there taught you to work, to live with, work with what you have or mm-hmm. what you're given. Um, what else did you learn around that time that kind of helped you in your entrepreneurial journey? My parents. They were tough on us, on me and my brother. Um, they didn't make things or do things for us. They had us do things for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are very much driving us like, you know, what doesn't hurt you makes you stronger. So, and we couldn't expect from them to help us out, but they would give us to tools to learn how to help out ourselves. My parents were building their house and I was probably 12, 13. I had to help. And my <laughs> brother too, we had to help build the house. I remember one day I told my mom, my shirt is not ironed yet and I want to go out. She's <laughs> like, well, then just do it yourself. Right. So from that day onward, I had to iron my own shirts. <laughs> and so, and then leaving, going abroad from early, I had to learn how to self-sustain. I didn't, they didn't, and London is expensive, so and they did not provide me with with much um, money. So I had to live on a budget and cook for myself, do a lot of things on my own from early on. And I think that also is what shaped me to see where I can go. Right. right? It was my bed was never made for me. Right. So our parents always made us do things. They they taught us what it means to work and what's the value of working and um, combined with you know problem solving and we we were lucky we lived in a part of Berlin where we had forest and a lake around so we would go with the bikes and go off and you know back in the days you <laughs> wouldn't have to worry about too many things and we just spend days in the woods and hang out and build things and tree houses and so you kind of learn to be in the outdoors yeah Nowadays, everyone is just on their phone, and I know I catch myself <laughs> as well. I'm constantly on the phone. Um, so that is where even, but even now with my children, right? How do I 
convey that to my children. Right. That's the challenge. Um, my daughter is five. And um, we built a drone. Everyone else bought their drone. Mm -hmm. We built it <laughs> from, uh, by ourselves and soldering it and until it was flying. And this year I wanted to build a weather station with her. <laughs> but I want her to learn things and do things and, and solve problems. My first inclination is always to let her try and fail. Try and fail. And because um, that's what my parents did to us. My grandfather, he was the, um, in the, you know, the point system for gymnastics mm -hmm. when, when they judged the, mm -hmm. in the Olympics, yeah. the points. Mm -hmm. So he was the guy the, um, of the committee within the gymnastics federation that derived these point systems. Wow. So he was this ma very strict man, <laughs> very, Everything has to be accurate. And so that has just been like through our through the generations, right? It's like this is accurate. You have to be and it has to be exact. And so that was passed on to my mother and passed on to me and and an old family old German family background. That's also where the, the name Night Fox comes from. Okay. Um, because we have a family crest which has a knight and a fox in it. And so that's how that that's name hype. came out. Family Chris. That's yes. that's how. Um, so I grew up in this very interesting family in a way, but I was never given things just because it was given to me. Right. My parents always made sure that whatever it is I do, I need to find a solution myself and work for it. And um, and so I bring that to Jamaica, and and I think that's how. That's how I look at things and that's where I find opportunities and I look at the opportunities and say, okay, I can work to a goal to get there. Right. So what do you see as the future for Night Fox? I looking at it as a company that needs to grow further. Um, I think the tech industry in Jamaica, Barbados and Trinidad are very interesting and dynamic and growing. And I think as a region we want to play part in shaping that future, um, working with um, universities and colleges to guide curriculums from a perspective of a private sector on what it is that we need so that we can create a larger um, pool of resources so that it makes it easier for us to then go and bring jobs to the region. And that's where I think we can fit in because we have proven that we understand what it takes and, and what is the international standard on what should be achieved. Right. And it is time now for us to, to grow that through training and, and the, getting the developers on board, understanding what is required, um, helping and guiding also with the government together on what it is that we need and our support. I mean, there's, I think there's a trickling down effect that's going to happen from the BPO industry as a whole, mm -hmm. where it now trickles down into the higher value um, opportunities. And I think we should be, as a Night Fox, playing a, a part and a pioneering part in driving that. Yeah, um, because that yeah, we have been talking about moving up the value chain mm -hmm. for a long time and... I have said this many times that Night Fox represents that next level that we, that we, that we should be getting to. Mm -hmm. What is your experience in terms of difficulty going up against other outsourcing hubs? So there's, you're going up representing Night Fox from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. There's India, there's Poland, or these other places. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to, to compete against those? We cannot compete against some of these countries based on volume right it's just impossible so that is why i think we need to focus on the higher niche inside the tech so um machine learning deep learning ai and as a whole um blockchain and and become experts in these niches rather than offering html css yeah. coding farms because mm -hmm. uh, that is not something that we should 
we should waste our time on because I think we, we cannot um, um, compete on that level. And then also, um, it's our geographic location. Um, we are on the same as the Eastern time in the US, same similar cultural affinity and um, language. Right. Europe, we're six hours behind. So any work that we get from Europe, they're hedging the time. Europe cannot do that with India hmm. because when they send their work into the future, they already lose the time. Whereas if they have work that they send to us, that they only started when they, they finished. So they gain an extra eight hours of working time by providing, by sending the work over this side. Right. Um, so we have this geographic advantage. We have the cultural advantage. We have developers that graduate from universities in the US and Canada and come back here. So we have similar educational um, advantages. And um, I think that is where we need to look at as a, as a region. Right. So anybody, advantages. anybody thinking about getting into an IT firm here should be thinking about those things. How do they get into those niches? Yeah. So that because it doesn't make you're right, it doesn't make any sense to compete against the volume and the low prices that these other countries would mm -hmm. charge. When it comes to your continuous learning and um, books, what books have you read that have been very impactful for you that you'd want to recommend to other people? I must admit, I'm not a big reader. Okay. <laughs> I read more um, about medium mm -hmm. uh, I love reading articles on medium every morning I don't have the time to read either so I, I usually opt for audiobooks and podcasts I have gone into po um, audiobooks now especially my drives between Mobile and Kingston right I am tired of listening to music so <laughs> I switched to audiobooks there's one book that I just downloaded that I wanted to read and that's called life 3.0 um, living as a human with artificial intelligence. Your office is in Montego Bay? Yeah. You well, also have one in, in Kingston and Montego, Montego Bay. Bay. Okay, why, why two offices? We don't really need an office for what we do, right. to be honest. So we have been able, through some trials and errors, to find a good combination of different cloud applications that work for us. So we use Jira for project management, linked with uh, Git for for the repositories we're linked all of it together through slack but yeah slack is probably the main form of communication for everyone in the team all right so how can people get in contact with you to find out more about you reach you ask you questions on social media or wherever? well you we can reach us on our website nightfoxapps.com mm -hmm. or send us an email at info at nightfoxapps.com all right is there anything that you'd want to leave with the audience say to them encourage them I always think about, I don't know how many people might remember, there was this very brilliantly done TV commercial by Honda where they had this perpetual motion of different car parts until the end, which was a 30-second track. And they had to film it in a continuous motion. And um, the point of the whole thing is sometimes things are not okay. You should ask, what if? Mm. And so I think that kind of has driven me all the time asking what if instead of saying okay. Right. And that's how we always look at problems when when we work on projects. Egbert, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me.